Thank you, Barbara. What a wonderful way to begin our worship. And now I want to greet all of you in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior to our time of worship. Welcome you to our time of worship in his name this morning. And if you will join me in the call to worship, uh, which we can find in Psalm 91, but it's also in your um, bulletins before you. Those who love me, says the Lord, I will deliver. I will protect those who know my name. When they, when they call, call to me, me I, I will answer them. them. I, I will, will be, be with, with them, them in trouble. trouble. I, I will rescue them, them and honor them. them. With long life, I will satisfy them and show them my salvation. Praise God. And will you join me in the first hymn this morning, number 436, The Voice of God is Calling. Thank you. 
Amen. God can use our weakness to magnify his power. Amen. Let us turn now to a spirit of prayer as we pray together the congregational prayer found in your bulletin. As we say together, O oh Lord, our God, help us to trust in you and you alone for our needs and desires and not in our own ability to gain them for ourselves. Help us to put you before our trust in our own abilities and see that what we have is what has been given. Give us, O oh Lord, a sense of satisfaction with what we have and help us to release our gifts to the world around us. For we are not our own, but yours. And what we have is a gift from you. So help us release that gift to others as our pledge of trust in you. In the name of Jesus, your son, we pray. Amen. And as we continue in a spirit of prayer, I will ask if there is anyone here that would like to share a need that is not before us in our list of requests or a uh, joy that you would like to share. Yes, Terry. Okay, Victory has an ear infection. And my yes. nephew Alan was just taken this morning to the ER up in Maine with trouble breathing and pain in his chest. Alan with trouble breathing. And chest pain, you said? So we will definitely keep Alan in our prayers. Thank you. Are there others? We do want to welcome Jeannie back uh, from her trip to Illinois. And, um, upon uh, the passing of her mother. We've been praying for you, Jeannie. We will continue to pray for you and the other members of your family as you go through this time. So if there are no others, then let us continue on in a spirit of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for being with us this morning. We thank you that you care for us in all our afflictions, as well as in all our joys. And we give you glory for, for the joy that you bring to us. We give you thanks for the grace that you extend to us. Lord, we ask that your presence be especially with victory this morning as she's experiencing that ear infection. And with Alan up in Maine in the ER with breathing troubles and chest pain. Lord, we, we trust that uh, you know exactly what needs to be done with both 
of these that we've lifted up. And we ask that you would guide the doctors in their diagnosis and treatment as uh, you continue to work your healing power in their lives. And we thank you, Lord, for all of those that are continue to be on our prayer list in whatever state they're in, in a state of needing healing, of being healed, of being comforted in grief, of, uh, of needing uh, attention in, um, in psychological and uh, mental um, problems. We thank you that uh, you have given us the heart to pray for all of these. And we ask that you continue to give us that heart of prayer. We thank you that you trust us enough to do that. Help us to be worthy of that trust. And we ask for your presence with all of them as we continue to lift them up. And as you continue to exhibit the um, changes in their lives for the better. And Lord, we thank you for sending your son to be with us on earth. Indeed, to teach us how to be more attentive to you. And as we approach you today, we join in that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now let us hear a selection from the choir this morning. It is well with my soul.
Thank you, choir. It was joy to be a part As we continue on with our service today, we turn to the gospel reading. And today it's from the gospel of Luke, chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. It may be familiar to some of you. It is certainly a... Um, a story that lets us know about some of the things to come when we leave this mortal life. And it's, it goes like this. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with swords, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sword. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your lifetime, you received good things. And Lazarus in like manner, evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. Besides this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. But he said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. May we hear in these words the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Be to God. So let us join now in hymn number 530. Are ye able? Yeah. 
with the sod. Amen. Commend our souls to God. My sermon today is called The Bosom of Abraham. Do you believe that this life is all there is to life? Now I would venture to guess that if you are sitting in this place of worship or listening online to this message, you don't think that. Because we who worship God are a people of hope. People who hope that there is something better to life than what we are enduring in these days. We have hope that those we have loved and lost are being cared for in a place where we hope to be re reunited with them someday when our own mortal life has ended. But where do we get this hope? I think this passage from Luke's gospel is one of those places where from the mouth of Jesus himself, we catch a glimpse of another plane of life. Jesus offers this little story in response to the Pharisees who try to justify their own pursuit of riches, often at the expense of those less well off as acceptable to God. Jesus counters that thought with this story. The beginning of the story is a direct confrontation to the pharisaical thought that riches are made to be enjoyed and are a blessing from God. The rich man of the story is indeed enjoying his riches one who is dressed in purple and fine linen, says the scripture, and who feasted sumptuously every day. It was a picture with which the Pharisees could identify. It was their position that allowed such enjoyment, their station that demanded it in a sense, but Jesus gets right to the heart of their self-serving position in the society of the day with this picture of the rich man gorging himself on the bounteous setting at the table 
and immediately contrasting it with the poor man who desired nothing but the crumbs that fell from that table, who indeed required them for his own life. Do you think the Pharisees heard the message? Do you think it might have at least piqued their interest? I think it probably provoked them to anger more than anything else. The rich man in the story is a parody of the Pharisees. It was not the rich man's notice of the poor man at the table that enabled his, the life of that beggar who was more passive than insistent, gaining his life only from the scraps that fell from the table of the gluttonous rich, who had far too much in front of them to be decorous in their consumption. It was not at the will of the rich man to help the poor man that the poor man received, received life but the leftovers that tumbled to the ground in their haste to consume the abundance of the table that provided the subsistence of the poor one. It was not the will of the rich to help the poor, but their privilege to have it all to themselves in great abundance. Their hurried plowing through that heap on the table without thought of what fell from their mouths or broke from the hole in their consumption and tumbled off the table that enabled the poor man to survive. They probably didn't even notice him waiting for those scraps. Despite the contrast of their lives, both rich and poor faced the same end in death. But here the story of their lives parted. Poor Lazarus, the one who lived off the scraps of the rich one, received comfort in the arms of Abraham the father of Israel. Some translations say that he was received into the bosom of Abraham. Thus my sermon title. And I picture him wrapped in Abraham's arms, wrapped in the embrace of love and care. This one who had received nothing in life but rejection and who lived without support or even notice around the table of the one who had everything was bathed in the comfort of acceptance and filled with everything he needed in his life after life. And the implication is that his needs would now be met forever. His comfort and ease would never end under the watchful eyes of Abraham. The rich man, on the other hand, was a much, in a much different place in the next life. In Hades, says the scripture, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. After his life of abundance on earth, his eternal home was one of torment, receiving now the result of his selfish pursuits in life, experience, experiencing perhaps the torment he inflicted on those around him that he refused to comfort or even see in his own enjoyment of life before death. 
His place now was all fire and heat, unending torture and suffering. He longed for just a drop of water to cool his parched tongue and finally noticed the poor man who sat around his table in life being comforted and comfortable in his new life. He wasn't thirsting or melting from the heat. Maybe he could bring him some relief. So he appealed to Abraham to let Lazarus come to comfort him. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. And he got his answer. Abraham was very clear in his response. Between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so. And no one can cross from there where you are to us. You made your choice by your pursuit of selfish gain in life at the expense of those who may have benefited from some relief to meet their needs. Your eyes were blind to the need all around you. You had your reward in life. You had your chance then, but you refused to better the world around you because of your pursuit of pleasure for yourself. The rich man seems to have accepted his fate after he learned that the result of his selfishness in life was this torment in death. But he suddenly realized that his brothers may face the same torture if they didn't change what they were doing and how they were living. He suddenly had some compassion for his family. And he said, then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he might warn them so they will not also come into this place of torment. And here's where the cautionary tale begins. Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. Now Jesus was speaking to a Jewish audience in this story a crowd that would understand the eternal implications of ignoring God. It was a crowd that knew the law and the prophets, their scripture, the writings that taught them how to live with one another and how to obey God. Their scripture taught them all about life with God and the way that God cared for them throughout life. It taught them about the justice God desired, the compassion that God had for all humankind, and the way they were to be a part of bringing that justice into the world around them. That phrase, Moses and the prophets, was their shorthand for scripture. Those who were listening to Jesus here knew what he was talking about. And Jesus used this tale to advise of the importance of knowing and applying that scripture to their lives. Everything you ever wanted to know about God and life was in those words. They had importance not only for this life, 
but for all eternity, for the life to come. If you ignore them, it would be to your detriment now and forever. So he, the rich and now tortured man said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to, the, said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will be, they be convinced if someone rises from the dead. Could this even be a prophetic passage on the life and death and resurrection of the man that stood before them? Could Jesus have been giving them some hint of things to come? Now there does seem to be some hint of selfishness that permeates the world in which we live. And in the country where we call home, self-reliance and independence are praised. We tend to live as the rich man lived, without regard for the needs of those who have less and survive only on the droppings from our table. Those things we don't even notice are gone, but are invaluable to those who need them. Are we aware in all our riches that there are in, has, has indeed been one who rose from the dead, one who came to forgive us of all our sins? The fact of his existence often gets lost in the hustle and bustle of our lives. The voice of the Savior is buried amongst the many things that consume us in our attempt to keep our lives moving forward and preserve our position in life. Maybe we need to hear the voices of those who came before him to prepare us for his coming. We can recognize Jesus better if we know what to look for. God prepared the world through the Jews to be able to hear the voice of the Savior when he appeared to that world. The brevity of his life was a flash in the pan of the span of time, but the days of preparation were a much longer period to study and learn of that life before it arrived. The resurrection and eternal life of Jesus is like icing on the cake for those who did listen and live the life he taught us to live through the preparatory words of the prophets who went before him. There are many who dismiss those words of preparation as outdated and outmoded because of the arrival of the one who came to fulfill them. Jesus explains it in Matthew 5, verse 17, when he says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to fulfill. And he continues in verse 18 there, for truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Obedience to the law and the prophets is preparation for acceptance of its fulfillment in the Savior. It shows us how to live with God and each other before we even come to know Jesus. I think we should learn from the poor rich man and not rely on even the one who comes from the dead to reveal it. 
We can easily dismiss that voice or even miss it altogether among all the other voices clamoring for our attention. Only when we are prepared in our heart can we hear the voice of Jesus. Are you prepared today? Still searching? Or yet dismissive? John Wesley in his day was prepared to wait, if necessary, for evidence of salvation in a person's life. For he believed that God calls each of one at each one at their own pace and in their own time of readiness. God's desire, of course, is that all would come to a realization of God's call to salvation and act upon it. All of us here are at some point on that line. Come today or come tomorrow, but come. Amen. Now is the time that we have set aside for the collection of our tithes and offerings. I was once a sinner, but I came, hardened to receive from my Lord. This was freely given, and I found that he always kept his word. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, and it's mine. Oh, it's mine. yes, it's mine, and the white robed angels sing the story. A sinner has come home, has come home, for there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, and it's mine, yes, it's mine, yes, it's mine. With my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, nevermore to roam. In the book tis written, save by grace, oh, the joy that came to my soul. Now I am forgiven, and I know, by the blood I am made whole. There's a new name written down in glory, and it's mine, and it's mine, yes it's mine, yes it's mine. And the white road angels sing the story, a sinner has come home, has come home, for there's a new name written down in glory. And it's mine, and it's mine, yes, it's mine, yes, it's mine. With my, my sins forgiven, I am bound for heaven, nevermore to roam. Father, thank you for the gifts that have been brought forward today, 
Thank you that you have given us the ability to bring them. And Lord, move them to the place where the, they will be most effective for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us join now in our final hymn. God be with you till we meet again. And I bet you didn't think we had more than one verse to that. But we're going to do verses one and three. God be with you till we meet again. I hope we'll be downstairs for a time of fellowship. Let us join now in our congregational prayer for renewal as we prepare for going forth, saying together, O oh, Heavenly Father, you sent our Lord and Savior, your Son Jesus Christ, to bear with us and build us up. Help us, O oh Lord, to fix our eyes on you and you alone for our provision and our peace. Help us, O oh Lord, to relax our hold on the things of the world we think we need to obtain by our own initiative. For you, O oh Lord, know what we need, and we trust that you, O oh Lord, will give it to us in abundance. Help us to put you first in all things and rest in the assurance of your care. In the name of Jesus, your Son, we pray. Amen. Now may the God who lives in heaven and looks down upon us through his Son, Jesus, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit, which they sent to be with us, be with you now and forevermore. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, those that were here by Zoom. <laughs> 